Welcome to Straight Talk Live. This is a nonprofit uh, podcast and webcast. That's right. We are now on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, as well as YouTube, Facebook, I, um, Twitter, and of course here live. And uh, Straight Talk Live is a conversation, and it's a conversation based on the most important topics in the in the realms of human transformation, digital transformation, and social impact. Basically, all the things that we don't see in our media cycles, the conversations we're not having out there in the world, especially in a post-pandemic context. So I am your host, Rick Snyder, along with our other host, Af Maholtra. Af, you want to say a few words about you and what has you excited about this particular show? Thank you, Rick. Uh, once again, welcome to the audience for another Thursday on Straight Talk Live. Uh, what's what's um, what's um, getting me going on this occasion on this show is um, our guest Martin Exers, who, if you if you've been following our posts, you know that I have um, a bit of history with this man, and I remember a conversation with him last year or year before last where he absolutely blew my mind uh, talking about everything from how elon musk and his organization will rule the telco world to this concept of disrupting the claims process in insurance many of us make loads of claims from time to time the tv busts or breaks down or your mobile phone gets uh, sunk in water and you've got a claim for it and martin has come up with this incredible innovation that he was telling me about a couple of years back alongside the fact that he feels that sourcing and manual processes need to be flipped on on their head and ai and automation can take over so all of these conversations happened in a 60 minute period and i got super excited and hence martin is here today he's uh, he's going to be an amazing guest i'm of course the co-founder of growth enabler um, i'm a venture investor and absolutely passionate about the 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 future we're creating for ourselves today I'm delighted to be on this show with my friend partner in crime um rick snyder so rick over to you again and let's crack on and let's give martin the stage thank you and i'm also the ceo of invisible edge author of decisive intuition and intuition's my business and i have a sense when someone's also very connected to their intuition and their creativity and they're coming from a different angle. Have you ever met those people where you can just tell they're thinking from a different place, not maybe where you're usually thinking from or what you see around you? So I was around a conference table about a year ago at a, a bank in, Lond in central London, and there was these amazing chief innovation officers from very, a lot of different organizations around the table. And we were having these amazing conversations about the future of the economy, finance, technology, uh, intuition, et cetera. And there was this one gentleman across the table from me. His name was Martin Ectors. And he was talking about these Harry Potter problems and how to solve some of the most creative uh, challenges and how to actually meet the times of the moment. And what I really got about Martin at the time is he doesn't just talk about innovation. He actually lives it. He breathes it. He is it. And so I'm very excited to introduce you, Martin, today to our Straight Talk Live audience um, so they get a real taste uh, and an, an ignition and an inspiration around the conversation of how can they, how can everyone out there also tap into their creative embers and get them stoked today. So Martin, without further ado, welcome to Straight Talk Live. Thank you for having me. Do you want to just say a little bit about your background so people who may, maybe not don't know about you get a sense of where you come from? Yes. So uh, several years ago, I was in software and um, I, I worked for companies like Nokia uh, doing uh, telecom stuff. Then I changed to uh, Ubuntu. Uh, we did operating systems and a lot of IT and, and AI and, and cloud and so on. So that was very much working with like the top innovators in the world, um, doing all kind of technology stuff. And I got bored of that. Um, I then changed to completely the opposite, I went to work uh, for Legal in General, which is um, number one in life insurance, in uh, investment management in the UK, in uh, retirement, pension, uh, and so on. And there I focus on, as you said before, solving Harry Potter problems. And I can go deeper into what that is later on. Excellent. Um, and my first question to you is, you know, we're talking a lot about innovation and transformation. And a lot of times I know that innovation happens when our backs are against the wall, 
where we have to be creative. We have to try something different because the old ways of doing things is just not working. Can you share a personal story from your past of when, when's a time where you had to dig deep or really come from a different perspective and shift your own mindset in order to solve a challenge that you had to face? Yeah, so, so basically 2012, the crisis came uh, in, in Spain, or the crisis was really, really tough in Spain, in Spain where I was living back then. And then unfortunately, um, Nokia decided to let go 17,000 people, uh, including myself. So there I was uh, in a country where there was absolutely no economical uh, opportunities anymore. I tried for many months. Um, and then it was like, okay, what do I do now? I had a family uh, and then we decided, okay, let's try another country. So I tried many other countries and um, I got uh, an innovation job um, as a contractor in the UK and that actually brought me to the UK. And um, it's there where I actually, um, uh, like all the innovation got accelerated because uh, I found that like there was a lot more possibilities and I learned a lot of new things. And, and sometimes these like changes is, is what exactly you, you talk about. There needs to be uh, something that like accelerates uh, it uh, or makes it possible. Mm -hmm. And what was it that had you had to dig a little deeper to find your path, to find your way to the UK? What was it where you, maybe you were challenged by something and you just had to come from a different place to overcome that? Uh, so uh, the other very, very challenging moment was once I, I, I got used to working, for instance, in, in high tech and then I, get, uh, then I go into financial services, all of a sudden all the rules change. Uh, you basically come into a new industry where you have no clue. Uh, that was also a very, very challenging moment because if you're used to just try out things and, and see if they work, if they break, you, you fail fast to try another thing. But in a regulated industry, you can't do that. You are talking about like the service needs to be available. And there's a whole long process before you can launch anything. So, so at that moment, um, I came into uh, a company. I thought I had a big budget and, and ready to spend it. And then I found out I didn't. I actually didn't have any budget and I didn't have any people. So I started to be innovative and came up with uh, a new idea. And uh, basically that's where Beatus uh, got, um, got born and where the Harry Potter problem started. So I asked the CEO of, of my unit, like, what are the real things that nobody has ever solved for you? And uh, let me try to see what I can do. And I um, invited companies and I was extremely surprised and a little bit worried that uh, after a week of holidays, I came back and I found 45 people in the room saying, what do you want us to do? And these weren't the average people. They were like from all the big com uh, companies, uh, Google, Accenture, IBM, and, and several more. And they all wanted to come and help innovate. Uh, and, and that's how we actually uh, did like smart claim, which uh, you referred to um, in the beginning as one of those problems. And, and Martin, uh, one of the things I found very intriguing and inspiring about your journey, especially in the corporate, was that um, it relates to courage and it relates to conviction. So when you've made up your mind that you want to try and innovate, you want to do something uh, that others haven't done before, you have to be able to navigate the myriad of complexities that exist in the large corporation. And often people ask us, in fact, they say, well, if Amazon can do it and Google can do it and Airbnb can do it and Microsoft can do it, in fact, Microsoft is a great example of a company that sort of re-energized and reset itself so you know they keep they keep asking these questions around the fact that well uh, why doesn't the large traditional organization um, innovate and change and be as responsive and I keep trying to explain you know the complexities and the politics and the bureaucracy but of course the fact that large organizations are like tankers you know it takes a long time to move them around so Help us understand 
a couple of really direct questions because you said we should, you know, people should join at their own risk. So let me just turn yes. up the, the risk dial a little bit. So Sorry. the first que- so the first question, two parts, apologies. The first question is, why did you join an enterprise? Because you're a born innovator, number one. And number two, how are you navigating or how should one navigate inside a large complex organization? Because it, it can't be easy, right? So two part question, please. Yep. Yeah, so why join a, a large uh, organization? Well, they have more resources, more existing customers, more brand and so on. So if, if in theory you get something new and now you have all the resources behind you to like scale it up, it becomes so much easier. So, so in theory, the bigger the company, more resources, the easier it should be to now scale up a new innovation. Well, that was a little bit wrong when I found that out. That's the second part. Like you mentioned the word change a couple of times. Why aren't big companies changing? And that's the key to innovation. If you can't change very quickly, you can't innovate because innovate is about trying something new you've not done. So if you always focus on, on like, we have to be good at what we're doing and what we did yesterday, tomorrow is better, it's going to be hard to change that whole mentality, that whole company around. And um, it also has to do with the basic structure. Companies uh, aren't additionally set up to change because most of the biggest companies now have a business that they've been doing for 20, 30, and in, in financial service, 100 plus years. So if you're doing the business um, that like your predecessors were doing three decades ago, still in the same way, why would you need to change? If you manage to grow that every year with 10%, it's very hard for somebody to come in and say, you have to change. Mm -hmm. And the real change that's happening now is that we are coming to an end of an era. And I call it the analog era, the era where like, you get away with sending a paper, even a fax or an in-person advisory meeting towards like an era where like, if it's not digital, it doesn't exist. And that change has gone uh, already. But there's still a lot of industries that have not really transitioned. If you take a step backwards, mobile phones is the best example. You had the analog phone um, and, and yeah, and the soft and that software defined that's in the world is often the catalyst of very, very changes. And that's where like I always wanted to be close to the software because really it makes a change. So if you want to change big company, you need to make it software defined. If you can go from like anything that is uh, throw more people at it to, hey, if I want to double or triple or multiply by 100 my business, I don't need to do anything. I just need more people to subscribe and, and participate. Then things change. And that's also the core reason why I see changes, why Google's different. Because the core business is not a pipeline business. You'd write a book, find a publisher, wholesale retailers sell the book on a shelf and now pick one and the money flows back and you get 10%. That's not the case in Amazon. In Amazon, they have a million Kindle books and you can pick whatever and immediately 75% flows back to the other. So all of a sudden that business scales that one company can eat the whole book market. And that's the the biggest threat to a traditional business there is. If that disruptor comes in your market and makes you well, you get over. It used to take like decades. And now COVID, it, it can take weeks. Like you, you can literally see your whole industry crashing together because there's an event that changes everything. So if you are in that position, you need innovation. Because your existing products, your existing distribution, everything that you've worked for decades goes away. So how can you make that company resistant to change? That's what really drives me. 
Fantastic. So, and we, you cut off a little bit there, um, Martin. I don't know if it's a bandwidth or reception issue, uh, but if that happens again, we might request you to turn your video off so we can we can hear you seamlessly. But I think if I if I try and uh, paraphrase what you've just said or summarize it, I think you're getting to the point where you're saying. A, you joined a large organization theoretically because you felt there were more resources, more budget, more problems, more Harry Potter problems for you to solve, which I, I guess is the, is, the right, um, is the right example. And I think uh, the other part you were referring to was the fact that if an industry or a company believes that it is under threat or it's under attack, and it, firstly, you have to have the foresight as a CEO and board to know that you could be disrupted. And that's another question. We'll come to that in a second, because of course, let's not take that for granted. Um, you know, humanity has two very powerful forces on its side. One is the infinite amounts of stupidity that human beings have, but also infinite amounts of wisdom that human beings have. It depends on which one you decide to plug in at what point. Um, you also talked about software a lot. And I think what you were saying there was, if your industry is under threat and you need to revamp and reset the industry, you have to be in the software business, directly or indirectly, because who you're competing with, a la, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Tencent, Alibaba, and so on, they're born digital natives. These are companies that know how to run software and live on software for that matter. So that's a great, that's a great example. Um, Another point, though, let's go back to leadership for a moment. Many people listening on this call are leaders in, in, and executives in companies. Some um, play IT roles, some are in business roles, but actually everyone who works in an organization or is part of uh, a bigger collective wants to do good for the company that they work for. All right? They wake up in the morning. Right now we do it from our laptops, but before COVID, used to go to work every morning and no one wakes up in the morning to do a bad job. Everyone wants to do a great job and make a difference. But there are frustrations. And um, if you wouldn't mind just touching on one point, which is how do you convince the board of a company to spend money on innovation? And right now, because of course, many people are cutting costs. So what's your take on it? How do you convince a board to say, uh-uh, you've got to spend more on innovation now than ever before? By not going to the board. By not going, By not going it's to like, the board. Yeah, so, so basically, the, the official rule is make a PowerPoint with a, a business case, convince your idea and your business case is super interesting, so they need to invest. That's how evolutionary innovation works. Um, you, you basically um, get uh, to um, the money and you now do it. But in big companies, that same bucket of money could either go to like, hey, some break which we have to do. There's a big customer that wants us to add this feature or this third option. If you're going to compete directly with your slide and your spreadsheet against two options, you're lost. You will never get the money. It's never going to happen because there will always be a high regulatory or some feature a customer urgently needs than something new. So that innovation is not done that way. So the way I do it is actually the other way around. That is, start with that problem that is really, really core, that Harry Potter problem. And, and a Harry Potter problem is just a problem that, like, the business has run out of, uh, out of ideas. They've tried everything possible. They don't even know where to start. And the only thing they can wish for is an innovator with a magic wand, hence the Harry Potter problem. So, so by starting with that problem first, you're no longer competing with the rest of the business because the rest of the business has given up uh, on it. Because the worst thing you can do is let's try something new and compete with this other team on the same thing. Mm. Um, well, they have a lot more political clout. They know the process a lot better. They, they beat you 10 times around uh, if you do that and as you don't get the funding. So focus on problems that people have given up on and now start with new technologies and new ways of business that haven't been tried yet. And this a lot of them out there. Traditional IT systems aren't 
uh, using the latest AI, the blockchain or cloud. So you can, by just applying those type of solutions, a lot of third party products and, and new business ideas like uh, freemium or whatever, you can come and, and disrupt a lot of things that traditionally weren't possible. And now it's about de-risking. Because if you want investable, you need to the point where they can throw the money at you to launch something. But that doesn't happen overnight. If I have this new idea to solve this, this big problem, I need to just show it to you. So let's say that like you're saying, my horse is too low, I need something better. But you can't express that you want a, a Tesla. Well, instead of me coming to talk to me, how are we going to mass produce Teslas and how I now need like a hundred billion to do that, uh, I need to take you and show you that there's something faster than your horse. So the Harry Potter problem is, can I add a fast horse? I don't need a supercar. I need four wheels, an electric engine and a garden chair. If I can put you on there, I don't even need a steering wheel. If I can add your horse in that straight line, you're convinced there's something faster than a horse. So that's where what we traditionally do is we do experiments in four to six weeks with a very, very limited budget that like is a rounding error for most departments. And we prove that like there is light at the end of the tunnel for the problem. We can mm. de-risk uh, this solution a lot because yes, we, we now know that like this thing doesn't eat grass and doesn't drink water. But like we, we look at what's possible uh, uh, to generate electricity and so on. And then we, we also don't go and say, oh, I now need a factory. No. Now that you know that we can do it, give me a little bit of money to make that one prototype that shows you an electric vehicle as possible. So give me three months time and some money to like build one. And in that pilot, let's see if we can get 10,000 pre-orders. If we cannot, then nobody wants it. So why waste our time on it? Let's fail fast again. But if we can get 20,000 pre-orders, all of a sudden we have 20,000 customers waiting and market fit is the only thing that matters. Mm. At the moment you can build a million solutions, but if you don't have market fit, if you're not solving a problem, it is worthless. So, so but at that moment, you can go and say, now I need billions to build that factory and so on. But now you have proven that you are having a vehicle, that there is market demand, that you can uh, make it, that it can drive faster, that you can do, and then it's investable. And as such, at that point, you have done the demo where the whole board now has driven around a circuit in that new um, hand-built model and now they can see it they can look at like people's faces that they've shown the product to and so on so that's what you need to do it's not about going to the board on day one it's about making your idea investable by de-risking it and making it clear there is market you can launch this it will be successful and progressively ask for money not day one and even then it's not that you ask for 10 or 100 billion you ask for 1 billion to to make the factory and then you ask for another one to now start shipping the first 10,000 and so on so make it just like a startup and that's what you need to do make that internal startup of core people that have the different skills i don't have a team of 100 people that are all the same. I actually don't have 100 people. I have a very, very small team of very specialized people in one skill and a T-shape. They can do lots of things very well. And we now look at problems with all different eyes, with legal eyes, with business eyes, with operational eyes, with uh, technical and so on and so on. And that's how you attack it. That's how you really get from a, a big problem to something investable that the board can stand behind. Fabulous. So don't go to the board, number one. Number two, it's not about a conventional business case. Number three, behave like a startup and test, build, test, measure, learn, which we as startups love to do. Build the internal startup inside your organization. I think that they're fantastic lessons. One challenge, and I know Rick wants to ask you some um, very poignant questions here as well. One, one curveball I want to throw at you, which is 
That sounds fantastic. That sounds great. And it's amazing that you're doing it in your organization. I'm sure it's going to have a material impact on the future success of, of the business that you're in. Why aren't, why aren't we seeing more of you, people like you with your mindset, inside large organizations? Why are we not seeing more CIOs, chief information officers, not just innovation officers, chief digital officers, and so on? Why, why aren't you all singing from the same hymn sheet? Why is, why is a minority operating in one way, but the majority still following the practices of what the IBM and Accenture tells them to do? Um, and that model is painful because those companies, I don't want to incrim you know, um, incriminate them, but companies who are used to selling long solutions and programs where they make a lot of money and you know, nothing is solved straight away. They have to say, right, it's a 19 month or 20 month or 40, 40, um, a 40 year program or whatever it is, you know, and it goes on and on and on and on. Of course, that's what upsets and pisses off a lot of people in business who say, you know, we've spent millions on this program in IT. It didn't work. So what, why aren't there more like you? And what should we do about it? How do we fix it? Yeah, so um, I think people are trained in a certain way. So if you go and do an MBA and, and so on, you get trained into like make the business case and do this and do that. You don't get trained in like looking at your sofa and say, what if I could like rent it to a perfect stranger? Would there be a business for it? And that's the, the biggest problem. People cannot imagine those new things and they don't like to start from zero. People um, are asking to like um, have a hundred million, have X people reporting into them and so on. And that is the biggest problem. You can't come and do a big innovation that's completely left field, that is totally different and, and throw a thousand people at it from day one. It, it would be enormously costly and you wouldn't get a business case around it. So, so you need to start small. You need to like uh, put your sleeves up. You need to create all these future ventures. So, so our team is called Future Ventures and, and create these small things. But before you get the money to like create a hundred, you need to create one. And that's where like, too many people think they can like throw a thousand people at a problem, throw a hundred million at a problem and it will get solved. That's not the reality. The reality is something easy does it. Something that like doesn't have too many features that like solves it in a really new, exciting new way and so on. And that's not something that you, you get if you put a thousand people analyzing problems and seeing which other buttons can we add. You know, you bring up for me such an interesting tension between creativity and innovation and security and wanting to know how things are going to go and what we're going to put our money on, especially with a budget. And so there's this interesting tension in a business. Um, and John Hagel talks a lot about this, that every organism, including a corporation, is like an immune system where they want to protect themselves from any outside invaders, which could even be change, right? Radical change could be seen as an outside invader. And so there's a way of trying to establish that status quo as an organism and keep yourself safe, protected, alive, secure, uh, all those things. And so how do you navigate that? Um, I know you've spoken to it a bit, but I'm just curious for all the innovators that are out there or people, whether they're in a, even a small business, uh, that's successful and they're getting used to their way of doing it and they're finding their formula. How do you keep that sense of uh, breaking the organism and introducing foreign ideas, perspectives and challenging the status quo, especially when it's also such a big behemoth? Yeah. So before I joined Ubuntu, a strategy person there was Simon Wortley. And Wortley had a deep effect on me because um, Wortley made a map on like how to predict the future. And also he came up with this concept of like three speeds that like need to be done in a company and three groups of, of, of teams that need to work. So it is perfectly normal that a large part of your business is about keeping the lights on, evolving the current mm -hmm. products, protecting the market. You can't stop doing that because then you just cut in your profitability. Mm. Those persons are very much Six Sigma and like optimization and so on. And they should be there and they should be doing that. 
but you need to separate two parts away from them. Speed number two is about the up and coming things, the, the things that we're scaling, that we're trying to grow, that have found market fit, but now it's about a race to capture the market. That is about like uh, growing things and so on. And that requires a totally different mindset. It's about a salesperson being able to do a great demo to, to enlighten people and so on. And that needs to be segregated from the others that are there to like automate and make it run like clockwork. Because again, it requires a different set of people. And then this speed number three, uh, which is about what's the next thing and the next thing can fail. So you need to be doing a thousand next things and see which ones you can de-risk and you now uh, push forward. And that's also about like looking at like how are these others working and how do we need to work differently? So it's not only about the product, but it's also the way you're working. You need to be, be able to challenge and create a sort of sandbox where you say like, okay, everybody is doing it this way, but we have an exception. We are allowed to do it differently. And, and for instance, traditionally, if we would hire uh, externals, it would take like um, weeks and weeks and weeks uh, to get them to background checks and so on, because that's all regulatory requirements. So how can you innovate quickly if you take like six weeks to, to get a contractor in? It's that sandbox mentality mm -hmm. where you say, okay, if we're going to do a trial and we don't know if it ever goes to production, we're not going to use live customer data or, or touch production. Why do we need to do all of that? Can we not get somebody in, isolate them from the rest, let them do the work, and if it works, then we can go through those processes in parallel. And it's those type of things that like that three mentality, that three speeds, that you need, because if you don't have that fastest part coming up with a thousand new ideas where like potentially tens of products come out that then can be kicked over to the other one to grow them, that then can be kicked over to the last team to, uh, to like um, evolve them and, 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 and distribute them everywhere, you are at risk of dying because at the moment, the only thing you, you can be certain of is that the product that you sold yesterday will have a shorter lifespan um, than the product that you sold the day before. And the product that you're going to sell tomorrow will be even shorter. And, and you get to the, to the gaming industry where like days matter. If you don't get that game out uh, this Saturday, then there might not be a market for it because mm. it's specifically for this event type of thing. Uh, so so we, we're seeing that time is of the essence. And this is the biggest problem in companies. They're not built to optimize time. They're built to optimize uh, efficiency and economies of scale. Mm -hmm. But in digital, you don't need them. With a mobile app, you can get anybody in the Scottish Highlands and Islands to sign up in a minute. You don't need mm -hmm. to go and put offices there in a big call center. Mm -hmm. So it's about that speed. What can you do to accelerate getting new products out and finding market fit? I really like that, uh, how you just broke that down with the three speeds. And it makes sense that if you're addressing all three needs of a business, you know, leaving the lights on, measured growth and the marketability of what you know, but then also being willing to break things and have that experimental unit in the, in the company that is already looking at things that might not be you know, in the next year, but maybe even further out. Um, and having all three of those represented in a company just makes sense. Makes and, and yeah. it's, it's not like this R and D unit, this, this mm -hmm. third one, you should put existing people that worked in the other places in there. And, and one of the, the hiring criteria is how rebel are you? Mm. Like if, if you're not a rebel, if, if you didn't have problems with your last three line managers, because <laughs> like you, you told them they were wrong all the time, you're probably not the right person. We're all going to get a job. Like, <laughs> yeah, like in innovation, it's not about the status quo and, and saying yes to, to the, the person above. Mm -hmm. No, no it, it's about, I think you're wrong. Let me prove it. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're, of a rebel mentality, you have mm. a future in that part of the organization. Whereas most of the organization is actually considered 
So, so that's one of the things that like you need to optimize for. Martin, there's one more piece that you touched on. Do you think, I don't know how you think about it, but you know, speaking from an entrepreneur standpoint, running my own company and so on, it's interesting that there are two, there are two sides to this uh, innovation game. One is you're an innovator who's innovating and coming up with brilliant ideas like you described and solving Harry Potter problems. And those problems are related to cost optimization, process optimization, efficiencies, making things better and faster. And there's another side of it, which is what Amazon, Google, and all the tech companies that have software products are used to, which is that you're building products to monetize. So your innovation starts to get sold and you're making money on the back of it. Tell me a little bit about what goes through your mind psychologically. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a chief innovation officer or even a CIO information officer in a big company, traditional insurance or financial services business, invariably, most of the time, not always, most of the time, is coming up with cool innovations to drive efficiencies, to make things better, uh, faster. But it's not always building monetization-driven products where, oh, I built a great product and we could flog this and sell it. It's not like what Amazon did with AWS accidentally. They used their own product internally and thought, wow, let's make some money on it. And um, tell me a bit about where you're psychologically, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so... <laughs> The truth is, I am focusing very much on, on, on making what I call platforms that are revenue generating. So, so I'm very much focusing on like the next thing, how can we apply that in many places and now generate money? So, so the, the idea of like looking at Harry Potter problems, one of the criteria I use is like, do a lot of people have it? Is this a problem that is common in different parts of the business? Because there's another cheat that you can do in a large business, which is if five businesses all have the same common problem, go to group finance and say, I have a solution that is twice as expensive as if like each one of them would come up with an individual thing but it's a platform that all of a sudden like can solve all their five problems. So if you subsidize and I can offer it at a fifth of the cost, I'm actually cheaper than if they would try to do it themselves. And all of a sudden I now have five internal customers. And if five internal customers want to pay for this, you probably can get like a hundred external customers as well. So all of a sudden you have that business opportunity, but you need to start with one of the five. If you need to really solve it, then you need to add the complexities of other, adding the other four before you can go and say, now I can eat a hundred externals. So we are at, at this moment going to that process where we are working with one and we are now going external and so on uh, with two of our innovations but it's a progressive thing. It's also another thing. Don't go to the board and ask for a platform. Try to strategically build one by stitching together projects that like at first glance don't have anything to do with one another. If you realistically look at like, if I need to launch a new product in this a company, I need something that connects with the customers. I need something in the back office that like, can like hold the business logic and I need something that can get money in. Well, the sky's the three, three different Harry Potter problems, get funding for all three and then magically bring them together. So, so yes, you have to be strategic around those things, but you don't have to go and explain it to everybody because the worst thing you can just try to convince everybody because then they will ask tons and tons of questions and you'll not get anything done. That's another basic thing. If you want to innovate, don't try to convince the laggard to like your innovation. There's still people out there that don't like smartphones. Uh, so if you start to convince people and, and until they're all convinced you don't do anything, you will never do anything. Just start with the first one. Can you sell one to one person? Can you sell one to a hundred and so on? And, and over time you'll get to, to the, the majority of people. You know, one thing I'd like to segue here is into more the social impact side of our program. <clears throat> and um, 
you know, as you're talking um, about solving problems, what I'm also thinking about is there's many different deeper layers of different kinds of problems to solve. You know, there's whether it's, can I get a faster internet connection or a better camera on my phone? And I want to solve that problem or something more around climate change and the things that we're facing in a post COVID context, for example, and, and how technology can help serve that as well. Right. And it's where it's not always just about profit, but it's also about, uh, ESG and good, um, social good and what have you in, in the planet. And I know you're very much, you care about that as well from our previous conversations. So what I want to ask you, Martin, is you said you have a map to the future that you were shown by one of your mentors. And I want to ask you, what is your vision of the future that you're seeing right now with COVID uh, as we're coming out of this context? We still are not very clear how the economy is going to shake out. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of unknown variables in the world right now as we speak. So what is your temperature check of where you see things going just from your vantage point right now? Well, I think we need entrepreneurs that create platforms that generate meaningful jobs and well-paid jobs for people. If we cannot do that, if we keep on like creating these platforms where like we make everybody's skills measurable and you, you, you have a race to the bottom, then we very, very quickly are going to get this like difference between the super rich, very few of them, and the big majority that just opens their computer every day and checks if there's something they can do. Mm. So unless we can come up with like platforms that can actually uh, help me make more money than yesterday, we cannot really change behavior but the ones that do will completely change everything because if all of a sudden i open up my computer and i go on this platform where like i can make more money being on there than doing whatever job and i do very interesting work our whole economy will change because all of a sudden i can work global so do i need to travel so much do I need cities where everybody flocks together? Do I need this or that? Like all our economical model is based around bringing people in concentration and digital could like completely change that, could have an enormous effect on transportation and communication and the way we interact. Mm. So if we want to really change the world for positive, don't think about like a platform where like, you can make people earn less and you earn more. Think about a platform where you can make people earn a lot more mm -hmm. and make their existing skills more valuable than if they are not on your platform. If we can get that platform up and running, then we can like solve a lot of our problems that we have in the world because a lot of our problems, climate change and so on, come from like trying to concentrate uh, people in two small spaces and now having to optimize uh, a lot of things there that like don't necessarily allow for green spaces and, and other things. The irony of the situation is um, Martin and, and Rick touch on a good question because uh, you would have all seen on, on different communication channels that you would see these pictures of a city before COVID and after COVID and mm -hmm. how go to Delhi, go to Beijing, go mm -hmm. to the more, you know, uh, populous areas, you'll see that the environment is much better. The CO2 emissions are much lower. Uh, the, by, the byproduct of that, a negative one, if you think it's negative, is that the economic, uh, the GDP numbers or the metrics that human beings have created for success for an economy have gone down uh, because we're spending less, we're going out less, um, and, and by the way, I was looking at statistics that suggest that the deposits in banks um, globally have actually gone up between 25 and 40% more deposits. So whilst we think, oh, people are poorer and it's harder, yes, they're absolutely communities that are struggling, but actually we're not spending as much. Even on a personal level, you'll all know sitting at home, you might be doing a few more takeaways or you might've become a chef because you've started <laughs> to source better ingredients and your wife's happy with you or your partner's happy with you because you're contributing a lot more you're spending less because you're not going out and having the prep coffee in the morning or the Starbucks coffee uh, or whatever. Right. And I think, um, I think we, and the ha ha habits take 90 days to create um, usually. 
And we've been in this more than 90 days. And I think we've all started to get used to this way of existing. Now, how does that link back to innovation? When you're sitting on the back of a laptop, as long as you're doing this, it's like you being in, our, in my living room, right? Um, and we're us having this conversation. I always bring up alcohol, so I may as, may as well do it again. We're having a bottle of wine or a, a barrel of beer, because I know you can consume some good beer. And we're chatting. I mean, we can still do that on the back of this laptop. We are innovating. We've got you on the show. We've created straighttalk.live. Many businesses will get formed right now because of this situation. So I think, I, I wonder if innovation, and Google does as well, but I wonder if innovation can happen without meeting people a lot face-to-face. Because -face. I do actually believe sometimes meeting people at the, um, at the I don't know, vending machine or the, the coffee machine on the corridor can actually be a gross waste of human time. And that's where politics and gossip actually comes from, which is distracting for the organization when it's, a, it's got a core mission or purpose that extends beyond making money. Let's imagine the mission and purpose is we 25% of all of our profits are going to go into ESG causes, for example. Then the sense of purpose of the organization is very focused on that. And if innovation says, I'm going to put up my hand because I'm going to solve all those Harry Potter problems relating to not just efficiency, but also things that will make us more responsible and ethical and caring towards the climate, um, may, maybe this is the new paradigm that, that we're talking about. Do you think you could do your job on the back of a laptop and still solve Harry Potter, Potter problems, Mar uh, Martin? I, I actually, my, my current job was the first one in years that I, had, uh, that I have a boss that's in the same country. So mm. uh, I, I, like, I, I thought about it, like the 20 years before, I was often working uh, in places where my boss was in another country. Mm. So can you work remotely? Can you innovate remotely? Definitely, yes. I, I remember the, the previous company, uh, we hired talent because it was an open source product and people were in a secondary city somewhere on the other side of the world, were bored for their day job and, and contributed their free time in this open source product. Uh, project and all of a sudden they got a job offer to do their hobby uh, and make more money than they made before. Guess how it, yeah, how motivated those employees were. So, so hiring the best people globally and bringing them together um, is, is a great way to innovate. And, and I think the biggest challenge, the biggest Harry Potter problem is like how can we make it that people are better off in this new reality, can earn more money now, can like solve people's problems better. If, if we find ways to entertain, to feed, to supply, to provide work with, to feel people, make people feel good with themselves, to, to have better health in this digital lockdown um, reality, then we probably are onto something. You know, we're just going to remind our, our audience to ask any questions right now of Martin. So please, if you're listening to this right now, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, or even live just on this uh, webcast, uh, please send in your questions. We've got our last 10 minutes here. I'll just kick it off while we're waiting for some more questions to come through. Um, what do you think is the future of small business? And when I'm looking at like Amazon's, the Ali, Alibaba's, Facebook's that have the resources, that have this uh, hunger... <laughs> of just being able to do whatever they want to do. And it, it almost seems like we're monopolizing in a way that we haven't seen in our era before uh, to an extreme with technology and uh, the rapidity of everything. What do you think is the future of small business given what's happening today? Well, if you look back um, 20 years ago, those very, very big companies were very, very small companies in a garage. And back then it was the IBMs and the others that were the Google today. So reality is that there are currently startups that probably will in 10 years dominate a complete industry. So I think that like the best will become those big companies because it tends to be that if you make a scalable solution that is very successful, you can't stay a startup because money starts raining in. And yes, we might see startups that like, just like 
WhatsApp all of a sudden like uh, generate half a billion in a buyout per employee type of thing. But um, the reality is that, that like they're probably going to grow very fast and, and scale globally. And then they become uh, all of a sudden too big and too difficult to innovate as fast as they used to. They, they get all these legal things and then a new one will come. It, it's this process that I don't think will stop. Hmm. Martin, as questions come in, Denise, do we have any questions or if you, if they are some from the um, social media, please, please send them over. Uh, whilst that's happening, a little bit more of a direct question around jobs and job security and unemployment. We've talked a lot about on this show about employment and skills and how do you keep yourself in a job and into the new job, as well as talking about the more dire and sort of depressing side of not having a job or unemployment. Uh, if someone on this call today is thinking about uh, their company, the company they work in, and they feel a sense of frustration, or they think, well, actually, should I be continuing after this reset in this organization? Because it's not innovating. It's no Google. It's no Amazon. I don't see any sense, any buzz, or any sort of a culture of innovation. I feel disenfranchised or limited. Do you think those people should... Well, I mean, what would you say to those people? I don't want to guide the question or the answer anymore, but what would you say to those people? Should they stay in that job? Should they leave the job? What would you do in that situation? So sometimes it's actually easier to be an innovator in a place where there's not a lot of them than to move to a company where there's a lot of them. Like, it, it, it's like if you're going to work for the company that has the best innovators in the world and you're a great innovator, but not an outstanding innovator, you might not be happier uh, because all of a sudden you're not the top person. Whereas like if you work in an industry that can use some more innovation, you might actually have more chances of being successful. And mm. innovation is a learning process. Like you need to fail. So, so being in a situation where like you know the industry, you can fail a couple of times, might actually be better than to go and, 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 and try to be among only innovators because then you have other challenges or to go on your own. Like, Hey, it's best that like somebody else pays the bill while you're failing. And mm -hmm. when you really get it, you could still go and make your own company. So, or, or as long off. as it's not your parents, <laughs> <laughs> like a spin off is something that like is also very, very interesting. So a lot of companies should make this entrepreneurship, uh, with ventures that get spun off a normal way of working. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what I learned about motivation is give people a blank sheet and tell them solve this problem and now you can start writing the solution and you're now completely responsible for it. That is so much more motivating than giving them a whole list of things to do this morning and say they have to be done uh, tomorrow. Mm. Uh, and so, so don't just drop your day job, find that like really next big thing. And if you don't want to be within the company, try a spin off or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but. That's great. Uh, one of our questions came in around what makes an impression on a chief innovation officer when you first meet one of them, like yourself, um, this person says, I'm sure a lot of CIOs might hate sales pitches and things like that, but what actually it excites a chief innovation officer, how, how do you get their attention? How do you excite them and make an impression? So yeah, uh, sending an invite on LinkedIn, inviting me for uh, yet another uh, whatever, like there's so many people trying to do that and, and that doesn't work. So what I give a general tip to anybody is try to guess what their problem is and make, for instance, a one minute video about how your innovation automatically solves it. And that will work with anybody. Like mm -hmm. if I know that you have that problem and you can like in one minute see how that unknown machine to you outraises a horse, you want to now more. And that's the native thing that people will like, they will find you. If you really find that Harry Potter problem and you know that you can solve it. So, so we did some time ago as we did a five minute RFI process in which we asked suppliers to go and make 
a two, three minute video and then a couple of slides uh, and show how they would solve it. And that's exactly the, the thing that people want to see. I want a solution that like blows me away. I want mm. to see myself, imagine myself um, in this new world. How does it look like? What didn't I know that you, what you're working on could really change? Mm. I love that. So no virtual coffee dates with Martin, although beer might be different. Um, but really, it's about how do you solve that problem? How do you get an, a CIO's curiosity and interest and really speak to the heart of what they might have be grappling with that you're intuiting? That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, we have, uh, Mateo asks, um, he really loves how you actively seek out Harry Potter problems. How many do you generate? Um, I, I try to not generate too much because one of the, the, the hardest problems is um, having a solution that needs to find a problem. So I have seen mm. that too much in technology. Hey, I have this new great technology and it can solve a million problems. Uh, but then you have a problem finding that those five ping problems. It's a lot easier if you listen to others that have we problems and you find those that like are repetitive uh, many have them and with one solution you could all solve them because those are really the more interesting ones because you already have your customers and distribution is this if there's one thing that is hard today is distributing a new solution mm. so if you already have a way to have a million happy customers and get to them why focus on an invented problem that might or might not have? Hmm. Excellent advice. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, from Rahul, uh, Martin, fascinating journey. What is your advice to some, someone young, maybe the next generation, for them to deliver such an open mindset with respect to innovation? How do they keep that open mindset as they're entering this new, new labor force? They've been there for a while. Maybe they've been even discouraged by some of the culture. Um, what, what advice would you give to that generation? Focus on something that like you really feel passionate about. Don't chase the, the opportunity that pays most in the short term. Focus on the thing that really you feel you can make a difference. Mm. And, and that is compatible with your skill set, what you want to do, what you believe in. And over time, success will come mm. because if you're the best in some type of thing that wasn't important, but now has become important, that will be uh, having a very, if you are mediocre in something that yesterday generated a lot of money, um, you'll not be successful today. You'll not be happy today. And so on. try to be focusing on something that you're really passionate about and, and, and focus on that and try to improve the world in that field. Martin, um, before Rick closes it off, I just want to say one thing. When I hear you speak and how you describe uh, opportunities and how we all can think a little bit differently, a little, a little bit differently every single day creates a more exponential effect down the line. It reminds me of a quote that I love from Oscar Wilde, um, which I've lived my life on for a long time. And you embody that, which is be yourself. Everyone is already taken. Everyone else is already taken. So just be yourself. And I think let's not have any fear or inhibition to just be who we are. I mean, after all, we talk about authenticity. Authenticity is just that. You're comfortable in your own skin. You're comfortable... Um, with your mind and how you operate. You don't have to be a social animal. You don't have to consume loads of alcohol to please people. You don't have to speak in a particular way. You don't have to come from a certain background. You don't have to come from, a, you know, be from a certain race. You've got to accept who you are and bring out the best in you. And I think it's, it's great to have you on the show. You've helped us sort of discover that and realize that. And, um, you know, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to hand it over to, to my partner in crime, Rick, to close it off and, and a wonderful having you on the show, of course. Martin, very inspiring as always. Um, and where can people find you or find out more about your work? Uh, where should they go? Follow me on LinkedIn. Probably the best place. Okay, but don't ask for a coffee date. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I uh, just want to let you all know for our, our, 
our straight live chat next week. Uh, very excited about this one with Charles Eisenstein. If you don't know him, you will, especially after our show. Uh, one of the, the most impressive philosophers, thinkers of our times, connecting dots everywhere from the economy to uh, culture to um, climate change. This is really incredible uh, mind, heart, and soul, and very excited to have him on board next week. Please don't miss that show. Uh, Martin, any last words for our audience? Uh, anything else that you want to say as we depart into the world today? If you want to innovate, do something different tomorrow that you didn't do before. On that note, thank you all for tuning in to Straight Talk Live. Martin, thank you so much for being part of our show. And all the best to everyone in this beautiful day on a Thursday. All right, go innovate, everyone. See you next time. Bye.